Chelsea face questions of football's abuse scandal, a shock victory for the Liberal Democrats, and remembering Andrew Sachs. You're watching Five News tonight. Ex-Chelsea player Gary Johnson says the club paid him thousands of pounds to keep quiet after he told them he was abused. I was just looking for a little help along the, along the way. You know, I wasn't looking for, I didn't know what to expect. The Lib Dem leader says they are back in the big time after their by-election win and... I know nothing. <laughs> what? I know nothing. A comedy genius, Andrew Sachs, dies at the age of 86. I'll be talking to his son, John, here in the studio. Also on the programme, Formula One's big shock. Just days after being crowned world champion, Nico Rosberg says he's retiring. Good evening, welcome to Five News tonight. I'm Matt Barbet. The former Chelsea footballer Gary Johnson has broken his silence over the abuse he suffered as a teenager at the club. He says, though, he was paid £50,000 by Chelsea to keep quiet, although Five News understands that the club maintains it was compensation and not hush money. It does raise questions, though, about how Chelsea has dealt with the allegations. As Julian Drucker reports. Gary Johnson ended the 1970s as a star at Chelsea, but he started that decade in the team's youth squad, where he's now revealed he was sexually abused. From the age of 13, he says he was groomed by the club's chief scout. He claims the late Eddie Heath would assault him and at least three other youngsters several times a week. So what was the reaction from Chelsea Football Club when Mr Johnson approached them last year to report his allegations? A payout of £50,000 and a confidentiality agreement, he claims. Speaking to the Daily Mirror, he says the money was a deliberate attempt to keep him silent. For them to pay the money that they paid yeah. uh, uh, with, a, with an order uh, tells you that you know, they, they really didn't want to admit or help myself for fear of um, being exposed. Chelsea opened its own investigation into alleged abuse at the club earlier this week. But today, despite these new claims about its past transparency, there was no further update. I'm not going to comment on the aspects of the case. Uh, I think it's only right and proper that we conduct our own investigation, aided by external solicitors. Uh, and then when that investigation is complete, we'll pass all information to the FA. Uh, and then they can, uh, they can have a look at it and... Uh, they would be the appropriate ones to decide whether the club acted appropriately throughout. Five News understands Chelsea did make a payment to Gary Johnson, but that the club says it was on the grounds of compensation, not a so-called gagging order, as Mr Johnson claims. But one lawyer told us that secret payouts, often described as hush money, are common elsewhere. Over the years, we have seen big organisations try to suppress details of abuse by resorting to confidentiality agreements, as they're called, these gagging clauses. It's certainly something that the Catholic Church did um, for a number of years, although less so now. So, um, you know, it certainly does happen with some big organisations. Those who have so bravely spoken out about the abuse they suffered in youth football are now demanding the clubs themselves show the same sense of openness. Julian, we understand that Chelsea have paid this money as compensation, they say, as opposed to hush money, but what should clubs be doing if they receive allegations of abuse from former players or anyone else? Well, all major organisations, not just sporting, they have internal rules in place to deal with these sorts of allegations. In the case of football, they, are, they have a duty to refer up, in this case, to take it to the FA or to the Football League. Now, as you saw there, uh, this has been put to Chelsea today. What did it do with Mr Johnson's allegations? But as we saw there, they are conducting an internal review and they don't wish to speak until that's concluded. But more clubs being pulled in to this story, more police uh, police forces as well. It's not going to go away. Yes, fresh abuse claims keep coming in. 18 forces are looking at this now. Kent Police have announced their investigation and England's second biggest police force, West Midlands Police. They have said they're speaking to alleged victims about four historical allegations. Uh, separately, the Premier League club Southampton has passed information onto Hampshire Police about uh, historical allegations as well. It is just two weeks today, though, since that very brave footballer Andy Wood would originally came forward at this rate soon a third of Britain's police forces will be investigating uh, abuse linked to football thanks a lot Julian 
The Liberal Democrats have vowed to fight against a hard Brexit after the party caused political upset in their by-election victory in Richmond Park last night. The Lib Dem leader, Tim Farron, has hailed the win as a comeback for his party. Sarah Olney fought the campaign against former Conservative Zach Goldsmith, largely on an anti-Brexit platform. And she says her victory sends a clear message to the government, as Catherine Jones reports. It's a good morning. Starve many more. Starve many more. The Lib Dem leader and his new MP out to celebrate a stunning by-election upset. Sarah Olney campaigned on a promise to try to block Brexit happening. It proved so popular in this leafy London suburb, she swept away a majority of more than 23,000. It was very clear when I was talking to voters on the doorstep that the thing that was really concerning them was Brexit. Uh, they were disappointed by the referendum result and they've been very concerned about the way Theresa May has pursued a hard Brexit ever since. Why have you lost? Is it because of Brexit? Conceding defeat at last night's count, the ousted MP, Zach Goldsmith. He'd quit the Tories to run as an independent candidate, gambling that voters would support his stand against his own party over the expansion of Heathrow Airport but this affluent area voted strongly to remain in the EU last June, while Goldsmith backed the Leave campaign, and the Lib Dems succeeded in making that the central issue here. There's no hope for this area in terms of the Heathrow. Uh, that's that's going to go ahead anyway, but the Brexit was a different matter. People knew he was a hard Brexiteer, and I think in the end that's what did him in. I would like to have remained. Sorry we didn't. This is a little, uh, little shaft of light, perhaps. I'm pleased. As well as giving Remainers a rallying point, what might this victory mean for the fortunes of the Liberal Democrat Party? What politicians of all parties will now be scrambling to work out is realistically how many other seats might be vulnerable to a Lib Dem revival. There are roughly 280 constituencies in Britain that voted to stay part of the EU, but by no means all of those are available to, uh, to the Lib Dems. And so it is going to be difficult for them to, to balance up their, uh, their position on, uh, on the EU with their targets in areas that are anti-EU. Even so, the party's leader says he'll give it his best shot. Britain desperately needs a decent, moderate, progressive alternative to the Tories. Labour clearly aren't it anymore. If it's not for us, who is there? Tory government for the next 25 years? Well, if you don't want that, the Liberal Democrats have just proved that we are here for you. The Lib Dems have their ninth MP, and the constituents of Richmond Park have delivered yet another shock in a year already going down in history for its political upheavals. Catherine Jones, Five News. Liberal Democrat MP Tom Brake is with me now. And Tom, I know, like your colleagues there and your leader Tim Farron, you're, you're getting ready to celebrate and crack open the bubbly this evening. But he also said you're back in the big time because of this. Really? Well, I think what this confirms is that there is a trend moving in our direction. So we've seen many council by-elections where we are now winning across the whole of the country. We saw the Whitney by-election where we came a strong second, having been in, in fourth position. And now this result, overturning a majority of no less than 23,000, uh, is all good, very good progress for the party. And we're back in the game and people are willing to listen to what we've got to say. Is it really a trend? Is this n not just a one-off because of the particular individuals involved? Zach Goldsmith was a Brexit MP who represented a very much a Remain constituency. Well, but he had a majority of 23,000 and, uh, and in normal circumstances uh, that, that is a very difficult majority to overturn. But the other results I pointed to, local council elections, Whitney, uh, points to people being willing to listen to Liberal Democrats and being willing in a way that they weren't uh, perhaps during coalition. Still a long way to go though, isn't it? I mean, uh, Sarah Olney is your ninth MP now and the first woman of this parliament to, to be an MP for the Lib Dems there. You had 57 when you were in coalition, if memory serves. It's a long road back. It is a long road back, but uh, each step at a time and the election of Sarah Olney uh, is fantastic news for the party. She, she was an excellent candidate. I'm sure she's going to make a very good MP. And the people of Richmond Park have made it very clear that they don't want the hard Brexit route the Tory government are taking us down. They want to, to try and ensure that we have the best possible relationship with the European Union. And that is what uh, Sarah and the Liberal Democrats will be fighting for. Yes, she, she says she would vote down Article 50. But it, it's not just the Tories taking people down Brexit or hard Brexit, it's 17 and a half million people who voted for it. So 
there might be a trend, as you say, in your direction, but is it really going to overturn the will of the majority of British people? Well, I think what the British people are finding, including many of the 17 million who voted for Brexit, is that the government don't actually have a plan about how they're going to deliver it. They, they're not clear in terms of where they stand on some very significant issues like freedom of movement. So the Brexit campaign was about stopping freedom of well, movement. They've hinted we might, yeah. pay, we might pay to have... Yes, our foreign secretary yeah. is telling foreign ambassadors that he is in favour of freedom of movement. So just very briefly, Tom, as we approach the next general election, is this going to be the Lib Dems' overriding message? You're the party of Remain, along we with are, the SNP, of course, perhaps. We are very definitely, in terms of UK, we are the party that is the party of Remain. And if people want a positive relationship with the EU, they should be voting for the Liberal Democrats. Tom Brent, many thanks. A lorry driver who caused a fatal crash which killed two people has been sentenced to six years in jail. The court heard that Keith Mees was looking at Facebook on his mobile phone just seconds before his HGV ploughed into a line of traffic in Hampshire last December. Train fares will go up by an average of 2.3% in January. Campaigners say it's more bad news for passengers who've already been hit by a year of disruption and delays. The Rail Delivery Group, which represents train operators, says most of the money will go towards improving services. Now, he was adored by the nation for playing the hapless Spanish waiter Manuel in Faulty Towers. Andrew Sachs, who brought us laughter and some memorable one-liners, has died at the age of 86. In a moment, I'll talk to his son, John. But first, Leila Hayes looks back at the life and career of Andrew Sachs. I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. No, 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 no. Nothing. No, no, forget that. No, I forget everything. I know nothing. No, no, you can tell her. You can no, tell her. I cannot. You just tell her. Tell her. Tell her. Oh, tell her. Please, please. Tell her. 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 I am from Barcelona. It was pure comedy gold and the role that defined Andrew Sachs's career. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, you can now listen. He not here. How many times? Where are your ears, you great big half-wit? He not here. Listen. As the Spanish waiter Manuel in Faulty Towers, he became one of the most iconic characters on British television. Oh, oh, oh Mr. Faulty. I'm very sorry. Very sorry. Is you? Yes, it's me, Mr. Faulty. Manuel. Manuel, let me explain. On screen, he often clashed with Basil Fawlty, played by John Cleese. But off screen, the pair were firm friends. He was uh, always thoughtful, Andy. He was a, a, a quiet person, but good fun, with a slightly wicked but very quiet sense of humour. Tremendously easy to get on with. I mean, in the whole of, 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 um, of Fawlty Towers, I don't remember a disagreement. It was a little bit unlike Python. <laughs> Sachs was born in Germany in 1930. His Jewish family fled to Britain to escape the Nazis. He trained at RADA and took to the stage before landing the role of Manuel in 1975. In the years after Faulty Towers, he continued to act. I'm sorry. Turning up out of the blue like this. This, an appearance in Coronation Street. But in 2008, he was in a drama of a different kind when comedian Russell Brand and presenter Jonathan Ross left lewd messages on his answer phone relating to his granddaughter. Andrew Sachs, who had three children, was diagnosed with dementia four years ago. No, 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 no. <laughs> his performance of Manuel has been described as comic perfection. He made people laugh and will be remembered with a smile. Leila Hayes there on the life of Andrew Sachs, and I'm pleased to say I'm joined now by his son, John. John, it's good to see you, and uh, sad circumstances, and we're sorry for your loss, but let's, let's just talk about your dad's early life, because he was born in Germany, he was brought over to Britain quite early on. Yeah, 1938, just before it all kicked off in Nazi Germany, and uh, I think the last straw for his father was that um, the SS marched into a cafe, they were eating uh, around the table and they took him out and they marched him off and and uh, luckily he had lots of good contacts in Germany and managed to uh, get away um, but that was it last straw just sent them all over and of course um, arriving like a lot of immigrants didn't speak any English you know the, his 
grand his mother said, "Okay, we're going to give you some English. How about this one? Uh, I'm a little German boy. I don't speak English." <laughs> well, that's really useful. You don't think he used at any point? I, I, I think not. You know, but that was the first thing he learned. And he then grew up and became a really hard-working actor, not one who was seeking fame or fortune, but wanting to do a, a job that challenged him. Yeah, that old school acting, which is just, you know, get out there, work hard. You know, they used to do repertory theatre. You know what that's like. It's a week here and a week there, and you're doing, you know, a little bit of Shakespeare one week and, mm. and maybe some Shaw the next. And, it, and it's, a, it's, it's a great foundation. Mm. Went to RADA, learned his craft. Yeah. And, and then, of course, landed the peachiest role, perhaps, of his whole career in, in Manuel, because we all know it now. Yeah. The two series of Faulty Towers are stone-cold classics. Yes. What was it like watching your dad in that? Well, very odd. I mean, to be honest, I must have been 12 at the time, 13, and, and very strange to see someone giving him a good pasting with all <laughs> kinds of manner of weapons and fire and stuff. But. I think John Howard Davis, the director, kind of put it in perspective for me and said, this, this is amazing script. I mean, John and Connie spent four weeks on each script. And, uh, and even then, I got it. And it, 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 the penny sunk in that this could be something very special. A huge deal. And, yeah. and, and Andrew uh, wanted to make Manuel German originally, I understand. Well, you see, the thing is, it's a typical actor. Now, how do I feel secure in this environment? I can call on German because I, you know, I speak that pretty good. Um, and I think John always had this as a bit of a slapstick arrangement mm -hmm. between the two of them. And if you notice when you watch it, the, the body language of, of uh, both of them is very physical. It's very Laurel and Hardy. It's oh, very, yeah. you know, old school. And I just think that, um, you know, that's why he had so few lines. You but know, he didn't need it. That's the he, point. Yeah, the the yeah. physical humour yeah. <coughs> was was fabulous and very memorable. He, and it was his idea. Okay, he he didn't get his idea through of Manuel being German, but it was his idea to have the moustache. Definitely. And that helped in the rest of your life because people didn't necessarily recognise him on the street. No, it, it was it was. I was amazed that no one recognised him. I was disappointed. You know. <laughs> you, want, you wanted to be. Yeah. Be why does anyone recognise him? You know. But they didn't. And um, it, but he very rarely got bothered until he started doing other stuff, you know, without moustaches. And which he did plenty, an accomplished playwright. I mean, as someone who has to talk on telly and, you know, often stumbles through my scripts, he had a remarkable voice, an incredibly warm and resonant and uh, a characterful voice that he used in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as natural history, um, documentaries go, he's, he's right up there, he's just got a tone. But also um, radio drama, did a stack of it. I went once to the BBC, I couldn't believe it, it was Alec Guinness and, and I, I, it's amazing how these superstars, you know, he's just yeah. done Star Wars and, and uh, the boy, and, and, and uh, the force be with you. And, and there he is sort of doing a little bit of radio drama for yeah. the equity minimum, you know. Yes. These, it's a fantastic business, isn't it? And you've inherited a fantastic voice yourself, which I know, I know you've also used to, to good ends. Uh, he didn't stop in, until right at the end. I mean, he was on EastEnders last year briefly. He was on Coronation Street not that long ago right. as well. Yeah, we, we were hoping he'd do Hollyoaks and get the, the triple whammy. Yes, quite. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, uh, I think the challenge with Coronation Street, my mum's a huge fan, so she probably talked him into that one. Yeah. I don't know about EastEnders. <laughs> well, look, thank you so much, John, yeah. for coming in to share your memories of your dad, Andrew Sachs. Uh, we'll all miss him, but we've got those fantastic memories of, uh, of what he did. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Still to come on Five News tonight. The plight of a million older people who are suffering and chronic loneliness. We'll be talking about that. And also, why is the Formula One world champion Nico Rosberg quitting the sport now? We'll find out after the break. Welcome back. You're watching Five News tonight. Now, as we approach the festive season, many of us are thinking ahead to days with the people we love, but many others are living under a heavy cloud of loneliness. A million older people in the UK are suffering from chronic loneliness, feeling lonely all or most of the time. And new research has found it's these simple things that they are missing the most. Things like hugs or holding hands or just having someone there to sit with. Louise Beale has been to speak to one pensioner who knows the emotional and physical effects of being lonely. Now I get very lonely. I mean, I can sit in here for three days and not speak to anybody. 
Jim Giles is 87 years old and has lived on his own for years. In that time, he says he's often felt crippling loneliness. He lives in retirement housing in a flat next to many other older people. And although they socialise, he says the loneliness never completely goes away. We did go out to the theatre sometimes, but then I still came home on my own. I used to go to concerts, and, but I still came home on my own. And, um, but then uh, you manage, and, uh, but it is not very, very lonely. Jim is one in over a million older people in the UK to feel like this. He, like many others, misses simple things like sharing a meal or laughing with someone. I've got people to sit for me. Yeah. <laughs> He's one of the neighbours and this is one of the neighbours. Jim is now using his talents as an artist to combat his loneliness. He did a degree in fine art when he was 80 and has now decided to ask friends and acquaintances to sit for him so he can do the painting and drawing that he loves, but also have some company too. A cup of tea provided, a little biscuit, and just sit down and I'll draw you, and then we can have a chat. Jim says he doesn't want sympathy, but hopes by talking about his loneliness, it will encourage others to do the same and help them all find ways to fight it. Louise Beale, Five News. Well, with me now is Dr. Kelly Payne from the Campaign to End Loneliness. And it's a, it's a difficult one, Kelly, isn't it? Because people prepare for older age in many ways. They might get their pensions in order, they might do a will. But do you think they're preparing enough for ha perhaps finding themselves all on their own? No, and I think one of the things that happens is when people retire, um, they lose a lot of their um, contacts. Um, so the people that they're in touch with, um, they're no longer in touch with day, day in, day out. Um, and so they have to reinstate new, new contacts, and that, that's really difficult. And we see quite a lot with chronic situations. People don't quite recognise that they're in the midst of it. We see it with things like depression or other situations. And it, is it the same with loneliness? People perhaps don't realise why they're feeling so low, but it is because they're lonely. It is indeed, and I think um, w one of the interventions that um, we worked with in Worcestershire, um, what the people became more lonely when they actually realised that they were lonely. They d it was something that they didn't really acknowledge and until someone pointed out that they might be lonely, um, then, then they did they'd see that that might be the case. I mean, look, plenty of people watching will want to do something to help, and going and chatting to your neighbour or recognising that someone might be lonely is part of it but should you be saying to them look may maybe you're lonely maybe you need to seize the initiative and do something about this yeah, I think um, one of the things that happens when people are lonely is it um, prevents them from reaching out um, and they really need to, um, to, to do that. But I think um, what, something that we can do is really um, talk to our neighbours um, check if there's anyone in your street that's, uh, that you think um, might be lonely, knock on their door and, and say hi and, mm. and, and see if you can chat with them. Just do something nice, do something neighbourly. And what about the people themselves? Because again, you know, a lot of them will flick on the TV to have yeah. a bit of company. They might yeah. be watching this now. If they sort of realise that this, we're describing them in some way, what can they do about it? Um, they do the same, go and speak to their neighbour. Mm. Um, yeah, so just really get out there and don't be afraid to connect. That um, it really takes, you know, you've got to get out of yourself and, and really go out and meet, meet new people. And, uh, and as a result of talking about this, do you, do you feel that the campaign that you, you've embarked on to end loneliness is getting some momentum? Are people recognising this more in, in society? Yeah, definitely. I think we've got um, a lot of um, organisations that are working towards it, um, towards ending loneliness. Um, alongside us, Age UK, um, Independent Age. Um, there's a lot of, of, of there's a there's a great groundswell of, of movement towards helping um, older people that are lonely. Okay, well, let's hope it makes a difference. Kelly, many thanks indeed. Thank you. Astronaut Tim Peake and actor Eddie Redmayne have collected honours from the Queen today. Major Peake was recognised for services, of course, to space research and scientific education. He was actually aboard the International Space Station when he got the call informing him he was on the Queen's honours list. Oscar winner Eddie Redmayne was awarded a, an OBE for services to drama and described it as an extraordinary thing. World champion Nico Rosberg has announced his retirement from Formula One just days after winning that title. He says he's achieved his lifetime dream and feels ready to quit, as Olivia Kinsley explains now. 
The wild celebrations of a man who's just become world champion and who at 31 years old is at the giddy heights of any F1 career. But Nico Rosberg had a secret on Sunday that this was his final swan song. Today he stunned the world of racing by announcing he's retiring with immediate effect. Since 25 years since I started racing, my goal uh, and my dream was very, very clear. It was to win the world championship. Um, and I've achieved that now. But yeah, so I've decided to call it a day, uh, stop racing here. I'm just following my heart, you know, you just live once. So uh, my heart is telling me to do this. Being an F1 superstar clearly has its upsides, but for Nico Rosberg, it's meant sacrifice elsewhere. He married his wife Vivian two years ago, and together they have a little girl. Rosberg says his career has had an impact on the ones he loves. His decision shows that's something he's had enough of. For his Mercedes teammate Lewis Hamilton, it's the end of a lifelong rivalry which has become increasingly intense. Reacting today, he reportedly said he's not surprised and that he'll take on whoever replaces him. Nico Rosberg is now at the peak of his career and at the stunning end of it. It's the start of a new life as a family man, one who's already got everything he's always dreamed of. Olivia Kinsley, Five News. Before we go, a three-year-old girl has been praised by police after she made a life-saving 999 call. Have a listen. Hi. Hello, darling. Where's Mummy? Say hi, She's fell over, is she? I'm painting. She was doing painting and she's fallen over? Yeah. Right, OK. Hang on a second. Mummy, I'm not sure. She fainted and fallen on the floor? I'm scared. Well, she might have been scared, but little Sophia Harmon called to get help for her mum, who blacked out and hit her head. She stayed on the phone to Essex Police for 40 minutes while they worked out her address and then sent round an ambulance. Sophia's mum made a recovery and she says she is very proud. No doubt about that. That's it from us. Chris Page has the weekend weather next. Have a good one. Bye for now.